So I also wanted to talk about um, the material so far um, this week on the 29th and 31st of October in terms of major depressive disorder um, and also the various different um, uh, sort of related concepts that we've been talking about, um, some of which are review and others of which are um, new ideas um, that might continue to come up uh, a little bit more. Um, so first of all, before we even talk about major depressive disorder, um, I wanted to introduce the, um, uh, the limbic system and remind you as well about um, the other lobes of the cortex. So, um, of course, we talked already about the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe, and temporal lobe. Um, we're going to be talking more about the medial parts of the temporal lobe, where the hippocampus and amygdala are, because that's part of the limbic system. Um, and then, in addition to that, um, also along the midline of the brain, sort of like close to the middle, so if you cut away one hemisphere and look at the middle, you see a number of other areas that are all interconnected, some of which are in what's sort of not typically thought of as the frontal lobe, some in what's part of the parietal lobe, some of what's thought of as part of the temporal lobe, but these areas are all sort of physically close to each other and closely interconnected with each other. Um, and so there's some argument that they should be considered a fifth lobe or the limbic lobe, um, or the, just called the limbic system. Whatever name we give it, the areas there include the orbital frontal cortex, which we've already seen quite a lot. It's involved in various aspects of attention. It's also involved in various aspects of motivation, worrying, um, and uh, um, appropriate, selecting appropriate behaviors, and so on. Um, and we saw it in obsessive compulsive disorder, a little bit in ADHD. Um, we've also seen already the nucleus accumbens. This is sort of like the pleasure center. Um, this is, of course, also involved in emotional processing. Um, and um, then one area that's new that we haven't been talking about is the cingulate cortex. That's this large area that sort of goes over this whole chunk here of the brain um, uh, and, uh, and is a very large um, uh, zone that processes emotional stimuli. Then along the midline of the um, temporal lobe, you see the amygdala, which is involved in a lot of different emotional processing, and the hippocampus. Um, for both positive and negative emotions, the emotions, the amygdala and hippocampus are involved, but often the amygdala seems to be more involved in fear and stress, and the hippocampus seems to be more involved in sort of calming rather than activating, um, which is something that we'll see um, in the next video that I'm going to make, um, where I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands. Um, and um, some of their functions. There's a lot in the, but um, in the limbic system, there's quite a lot of interconnection with other areas of the brain, like the frontal lobes and also sensory areas into the cingulate, um, as well as back and forth connections between the cingulate and the amygdala, the cingulate and the hippocampus, hippocampus and the amygdala. The amygdala gets some direct sensory information, as does the hippocampus. Um, the nucleus accumbens, and ventral tegmental area are also interacting with these areas, the amygdala and the hippocampus and the cingulate. Um, we're going to be especially interested in the amygdala connections to the hypothalamus. Um, the amygdala connections to the hypothalamus, so, so that, like I mentioned before, first of all, the cingulate cortex is sort of, broadly speaking, the conscious experience of emotions, both positive and negative. The amygdala is sort of the more subconscious or autonomic, automatic responses to emotion. Um, and, um, and so this involves the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Now, the autonomic nervous system has two branches. Um, one branch is the sympathetic nervous system. This uses norepinephrine and epinephrine. Norepinephrine comes from um, the neurons themselves and can act on individual organs one at a time. It's the fight flight, fear, flee, freeze response, um, and also excitement. Um, uh, and, um, and what this does is it increases heart rate and respiration, it shuts down the digestive system, it dilates the pupils, it decreases sex drive, and it turns down immune function, sort of prioritizing getting away from a situation or fighting your way out of a situation. Um, the um, Norepinephrine comes from neurons in the spinal cord and actually um, in sort of clumps right outside the spinal cord. Um, and then the epinephrine comes from deep within the adrenal glands, an area called the adrenal medulla. Um, also from the amygdala, 
you can have activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. This is involved in rest and digesting relaxation. Um, this increases digestion, um, decreases heart rate and blood pressure, slows down respiration, constricts the pupils, and it involves, um, so the, the norepinephrine involves beta receptors, these are GS associated, um, and then the uh, parasympathetic involves adrenergic receptors, uh, sorry, it's, it's, it's cholinergic receptors, acetylcholine receptors, in particular, um, a metabotropic acetylcholine receptor, so not the ion channel that we talked about with muscles, but instead a metabotropic GI inhibitory receptor. That's how the autonomic nervous system slows down um, the, um, the, the brain, uh, slows down, slows down the, the, the body and the periphery, um, and, can, and can sort of help to relax. We are going to, it turns out that the sympathetic nervous system is a fast pathway. There is also, involving the amygdala and the hypothalamus, a slower and longer lasting stress response that also confusingly involves the adrenal glands but a different part called the adrenal cortex. I'm going to make a separate video about that and then we're going to discuss that next week. So the autonomic responses are relatively fast. Um, and um, the and fast acting and short lasting, the um, the hypothalamus and hypothalamus pituitary adrenal cortex, not the adrenal medulla, the adrenal cortex, um, are involved in cortisol release and slower stress responses. But before we get to that, um, there were a few questions about biomarkers. Um, one of them was just about, you know, what is a biomarker? And one thing to be aware of is biomarkers are things that differences on average, either differences on average between disease and control or differences on average between um, uh, d people with a disease who respond versus to a trial drug versus people who don't. Um, when you look at one biomarker at a time, like the size of a particular brain area or activity in one particular brain area, um, what you see is that on average there are differences between disease and healthy or between um, people who respond to a drug versus people who don't. But, um, but one individual biomarker doesn't give you a guarantee about whether somebody has a disease or whether somebody's going to respond to a drug. This is why um, some of these multi-brain approaches that um, are just beginning, that Maya talked about in her lecture, are really important. Um, but then um, getting into depression itself, you should know most of the symptoms of depression, um, especially the underlined ones here. And then in the context of depression, you should remember what we talked about the norepinephrine and especially focus in now on the alpha-1 and alpha-2 norepinephrine receptors. Um, the alpha-1 receptors are GQ-associated. That means the effects on the cell are complicated. But overall, alpha-1 receptor activation tends to lead to feeling overwhelmed. One piece of evidence for this is that in... Um, brains of people with major depressive disorder, we find more alpha-1 receptors than in control. Again, on average, not in every individual. Alpha-2, on the other hand, are GI-associated. They tend to be calming, focusing, and also generally um, promote feelings of happiness, elevated mood. Um, even though they inhibit neurons, they can actually sort of make people feel happier on average. Um, within the context of norepinephrine, we talked about um, uh, a somewhat newer drug for treating major depressive disorder, which is the selective norepinephrine re reuptake inhibitor, or NRI, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. These are effective antidepressants for some people, but one confusing thing about them is they take weeks to take effect. There are a few reasons why this is weird. First of all, norepinephrine levels go up right away. Second of all, I just said a minute ago that a lot that, that on average people with major depressive disorder have more norepinephrine receptors. So it's weird that we're treating an excess of norepinephrine receptors by increasing the norepinephrine uh, uh, in the synapse. Um, there were a couple different ways that we thought about that this could make sense. Um, one is that it could be that there is some compensation, compensatory removal. Remember, compensatory removal is not 100%, is not completely undoing. So for example, if you're treatment doubles the amount of norepinephrine in your synapses, then you might only get a 20% reduction in alpha-1, but maybe only a 5% reduction in alpha-2, and that will improve the ratio. Another hypothesis relates to the fact that the alpha-2s have slightly lower affinity, and so when we increase norepinephrine amount, that might help. Neither one of these fully explains all of the data, and there's some data to back them up and some data that sort of contradicts them. So, I, so, so ultimately, 
these are both incomplete explanations, but, um, but you should be aware that they are probably not totally wrong and you should know about them, but also probably not totally right. Um, we then also talked about serotonin, which is of course a lot more studied in major depressive disorder. Um, serotonin has many different kinds of receptors. There are 12 different kinds of receptors in all. The 5-HT1 receptors are GI associated. So just like the GI associated alpha-2 adrenergic receptors, the 5-HT1 receptors have a calming, relaxing, mood elevating um, uh, uh, effect. Um, and then the GQ associated 5-HT2 receptors, um, just like the GQ associated alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, lead to feeling overwhelmed. Um, we talked about how there might be some sort of similar um, compensation uh, uh, and the similar hypotheses that we talked about before. Um, there were some questions about medications. So a number of different medications for, um, uh, for uh, major depressive disorder. Generally, um, they involve elevating serotonin and or norepinephrine. So SSRIs elevate serotonin by blocking serotonin transporters, SNRIs block both serotonin and norepinephrine transporters, so elevate both. NRIs block just norepinephrine transporter. There's a drug Wellbutrin that blocks norepinephrine and dopamine transporter, which is going to elevate those two neurotransmitters. Um, tricyclic antidepressants and, tr and trazodone um, some affect transporters as well as 5-HT2 receptors. We're going to return to that on Tuesday, um, November 5th. Um, and then also monoamine oxidase inhibitors, while they have a lot of um, potential side effects and can affect other organs as well, um, they do stop the breakdown of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, which means more serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So it's kind of similar to um, serotonin transport, norepinephrine transport, and dopamine transport blockers, which also can elevate those three neurotransmitter levels. Um, so, yeah, so I think that, that was everything from, um, from Tuesday. Um, today we talked about a number of different studies. Um, first of all, actually, just as a reminder, um, uh, with the exception of glutamate, GABA, and some acetylcholine receptors, everything, all the neurotransmitters that we're going to talk about, in fact, the vast majority of neurotransmitters in the brain, all act through G-protein metabotropic receptors. Um, we talked again about serotonin transporter blockers and some potential analogies and similarities um, with, uh, um, with what we discussed on Tuesday in terms of norepinephrine transporters and norepinephrine receptors and the two different receptor types. Um, so you should certainly review those. Then the first study that we discussed uh, today was um, the study by Caspi. In that study, they looked at the interaction between um, serotonin transporter alleles and um, risks for depression. So there are two different versions of the serotonin transporter. There's a long allele that makes a large protein and a short allele that makes a smaller protein. The short allele is more efficient at cleaning out serotonin. Um, the long allele is actually a little bulkier and slower. And it turns out that um, What's been known for a long time is that people with the long allele generally are at lower risk of depression. It's sort of like having natural Prozac, where your serotonin transporters are naturally slowed down. Um, Prozac blocks some of the serotonin transporters, and so on average slows things down. Um, this study, though, was interested in trying to figure out how do genotype and environment interact. There are a couple different possibilities. One is that um, just that the, um, that the short allele always has a higher risk and the long allele always has a lower risk, but then the, the environmental contribution is similar. It's just going to, you know, more stress increases the risk the same way for both, um, uh, for both genotypes. Um, and then heterozygotes, people who have one of each, are going to be intermediate. Um, the other hypothesis is that um, uh, the long allele and short alleles might not change the risk of, um, of um, depression uh, and depression symptoms um, when there's low stress. But then if there is high stress, the relationship, that, then that makes the, the person more sensitive to that stress. 
Um, and in fact, what we saw was something more like the second case. There's a paper that talks about, uh, the, the, there's a perspective, an opinion piece that I posted on Canvas related to a question about um, is it really even appropriate to think of it as a risk allele or is it just an allele that changes the way the organism, uh, the person, interacts with their environment and the stresses in their environment. Um, the second study that we looked at was one by Samuels. In this study, they had, um, they had a, a few different groups. So first of all, they had, um, it was all in mice. All of the mice were exposed to a lot of chronic stress. So all of the mice um, saw, um, had decreased motivation, decreased, act, decreased activity, decreased mobility, um, and decreased um, desire to sort of go into exposed spaces. So those are the symptoms in the mice that we're measuring. Um, so if we have stressed out mice, normal mice that we stress out, then they show those decreased mobility and decreased sort of venturing out into open exposed spaces. If we remove the 5-HT1 receptor, same thing, those mice um, after being stressed out have, um, don't venture out into exposed spaces and they become immobile. Um, if we treat our normal control mice that have been stressed out with Prozac, then those symptoms go away. But then if we have these mice that are lacking the 5-HT1 receptor and treat them with Prozac, the symptoms do not go away. And so what that means is that, um, what we infer from that is that the 5-HT1 receptor's presence is somehow necessary for Prozac to work. The presence of the 5-HT1 receptor is necessary for Prozac to work, for fluoxetine to be effective. Um, we will talk about maybe some ideas about how this might be happening um, on Tuesday, but there's still, again, as with many things, a lot that we don't know. The last study we talked about, and we'll begin um, on Tuesday with this, um, is what about if we sort of, you know, so we've got some evidence that the 5-HT2 receptors are maybe a problem. What if we just don't bother messing with serotonin levels and just go right at the 5-HT2 receptors? What if we block the 5-HT2 receptors? And so what they did is they had a few various controls where they gave inert solution and SSRIs um, over a period of just five days, which is before the SSRIs should take effect. And they're again measuring sort of mobility, anxiety, whether they persist at swimming and so on. Um, what they found is that, again, control mice, if you just give them a control solution, no drug at all, they, uh, after being stressed out, they become immobile, and they, in this case, don't sort of keep swimming. They sort of give up. If you put them in a swimming pool, they sort of give up and just kind of float after a while instead of trying to escape. If you give them five days of SSRIs, it doesn't help. SSRIs take longer than that. But after just five days of 5-HT2 receptor blockers, those mice do show less immobility, so less symptoms of depression, and more swimming, more motivation to sort of escape from the swimming pool that you put them in. And so that indicates that these 5-HT2 receptors can be effective at treating these depressed-like symptoms in a mouse very quickly. Um, that's the last bit that we'll talk about for today. I'm going to upload a third video um, where I'm going to talk through some of the um, uh, some of the stuff related to the HPA axis that you had on your last homework. Um, and that is going to have additional questions um, that will be graded not just for completion, but for, um, um, uh, but for sort of correctness um, on the next homework due Monday.